stressful medical sorry, <laughs> coping, uh, conquering stressful medical events. Um, and we're gonna be discussing strategies uh, specifically for children uh, with intellectual or developmental disabilities and Down syndrome. Uh, so first, before we get into all that, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, so CPTS was founded in 2002 as part of the National uh, Child Traumatic Stress Network. Uh, so we are celebrating our 20th uh, year anniversary this year. So we're really excited about that. Uh, and our mission is to address health related trauma in the lives of children and families. And we focus primarily on increasing awareness and recognition of medical traumatic stress, developing and disseminating tools and resources for professionals, providing trauma informed care training, and developing resources for patients and families. So we have a multidisciplinary team that brings together psychology, social work, medicine, nursing, and public health. And we have team members located in Pennsylvania, Delaware, Kentucky, and Maine. We also have a national family advisory committee as well as a nursing advisory committee. And these committees really help us by sharing their experiences with medical trauma and traumatic stress. And they help us review educational materials and resources in development. They also participate in outreach efforts to provide supportive information about coping to other families affected by medical traumatic stress. And as, a, and as I mentioned, CPTS is part of the NCTSN, which, is, which was created in 2000 uh, to raise the standard of care and increase access to services for children and families who experience or witness traumatic events. Um, and the NCTSN is funded by uh, SAMHSA, uh, which stands for Subst Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, and the network has grown from 17 funded centers in 2001 to over 168 uh, currently funded centers. Um, that include individuals working in hospitals, universities, and community-based programs. Uh, so the NCTSN is a, a great resource um, for trauma-related uh, resources. So today we're gonna be covering four main areas. First, we're gonna define and discuss what stressful medical events are and what they might look like, uh, preparing and also navigating stressful medical events, and then we'll share some caregiver and family resources as well. So what is a pediatric stressful medical event? So when we're thinking about trauma and traumatic stress, uh, there are three pieces that need to occur. And we call these the three E's. So individual trauma results from an event, a series of event or a set of circumstances. So something has to happen. Um, that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the person's functioning um, and mental, physical, social, emotional, um, or spiritual well-being. So really trauma equals potentially stressful event and tra traumatic stress equals reactions to that event or experience. And we define pediatric medical traumatic stress um, as a set of psycho psychological and physiological responses of children and their families to pain, injury, medical procedures, and invasive or frightening treatment experiences. And medical trauma can occur as a response to a single or multiple stressful medical events. So in other words, medical traumatic stress is emotional reactions to scary stuff. Children may have other kinds of reactions to stressful medical events as well, um, including behavioral changes or symptoms of depression or anxiety. Um, and for most people, when they experience a medical stressful event, it is very normal for, the, for them. To, uh, it's normal to, be, to have a traumatic stress reaction. Uh, so something scary happens, you, you perceive it as scary, um, and you react um, and experience certain things and feelings. Uh, so most people will have that initial spike and then they'll return over time to what's normal for them. Uh, but for some, for some people and some families, um, and research tells us that could be between, anywhere between 
15 and 30 percent of parents, children, and siblings experience persistent traumatic stress. Um, so reactions that impair daily functioning and affect treatment adherence and recovery. And it's important to note that when it when it count what what counts in risk for traumatic stress is not the objective severity of the child's illness, uh, but the subjective experience of the child or parent. Um, so are they feeling scared or helpless? Uh, do they think they might die? Um, so it's an individual's experience of this stressful medical event, not necessarily the event itself that is traumatizing. And again, experiencing some traumatic stress symptoms is, is normal. Um, and everyone's different and will perceive experiences differently. Uh, what is traumatic to one person may not be traumatic to another. And when a constellation of these symptoms persist and cause distress um, over several weeks or a month of time, um, time the individual may have post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. And traumatic medical experiences are rarely a single event. All along the continuum of care, children and families in medical settings can experience multiple traumatic experiences um, and things that will trigger feelings or remind them of those experiences. Um, so things like challenges of the belief that you know, the world is safe, uh, the sense of, 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 life threat, of life threat, so regardless of objective prognosis, um, treatment setbacks, ongoing uncertainty about treatment course and outcome, pain or painful procedures, exposures to distress, pain, uh, the death of others um, like other patients, um, the medical environment, so the, you know, the hospital, sights, sounds and smells, um, separation from parents, reminders of past traumatic medical experiences um, and physical limitations or impairment. So research has shown that when a child is ill, all family members can be affected. The ill child, siblings, parents, and other family members. Uh, so research has also shown that children and parents may find different aspects of the, of the experience traumatic. Um, so a child might find, you know, getting a shot traumatic or a stay at the hospital. Um, and there are other aspects that a parent might find um, traumatic. So they might not be, you might not experience um, the same uh, trauma. And traumatic stress reactions go beyond usual stress reactions. At times, these reactions are triggered by reminders or thoughts of the stressful medical event. Sometimes the trigger is not so obvious. Um, it could be uh, something such as sight, smell, or the sound that uh, that person is not even aware is a reminder. Uh, so it's important to recognize what traumatic stress can look like. So there are four main types of traumatic stress symptoms. So first being re-experiencing. Uh, so that could be thinking a lot about the, stress, the stressful medical event, feeling distressed at thoughts or reminders of the event, having nightmares and flashbacks. There's also avoidance. So the person may avoid thoughts or feelings about the stressful medical event, or they may avoid places or act of activities that remind them of the event. Uh, changes in, in thinking and moods, so having strong negative thoughts um, that could be feeling very scared, angry, guilty, or ashamed, and um, hyperarousal that could be increased irritability, troubles concentrating or sleeping, um, exaggerated startle response like jumping at a loud noise, or um, hypervigilance, um, so always expecting danger or worrying about upcoming events which may manifest as repeating the same question um, over and over again. Uh, so some red flags could be you know, cognitive effects, uh, difficulty acquiring new skills, processing new information, uh, poor verbal communication or loss of communication ability, uh, physiological effects like stomach aches, headaches, um, can't sleep, uh, loss of acquired developmental skills, bedwetting, soiling, behavioral effects, such as aggressive behavior, screaming or crying excessively, iterable mood, uh, verbally uh, or abusive behavior, being fearful or avoidant of people or situations. Um, so those are just some examples 
of traumatic stress symptoms. And additional factors to consider for individuals uh, with Down syndrome or IDD. Um, so individuals with DS or IDD might have difficult with expressive language. So symptoms such as obsessive thoughts or feelings of worthlessness um, tend to be difficult to notice or assess. Um, they may be overwhelmed by sensory experiences in the medical setting, um, like noises or flashing lights. Um, they may also have comorbid uh, conditions such as uh, ADHD or autism as well. And child behaviors that can be challenging to manage include refusal to be touched, move, or cooperate. Um, this can make it um, even more difficult during medical procedures like getting blood work, or shot, um, difficulty focusing on multi-step directions, fear of the environment or treatment can lead to combative behavior or, or flight. And we recognize that providers can also display beha behaviors that can be challenged to, challenging to manage. They may misinterpret fear or anxiety as um, non-compliance compliance or aggression and lack of patience due to competing demands on time. Uh, lack of experience with individuals with different needs and abilities. Um, and this is why uh, trauma-informed care training is so important. Um, a trauma-informed care healthcare system incorporates awareness of trauma across all aspects of care with the goal of decreasing the potentially traumatic effects of stressful medical events. So what is trauma-informed care? Uh, a trauma-informed approach to care acknowledges that healthcare organizations and care teams need to have a complete picture of a patient's life situation, uh, past and present, in order to provide effective healthcare services with a healing orientation. Um, adopting trauma-informed care practices can potentially improve patient engagement, treatment adherence, and health outcomes, as well as provider and staff wellness. Um, trauma-informed care, seeks to realize the widespread impact of trauma and understand paths for recovery, recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in patients, families, and the staff themselves, um, and to in integrate knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices, um, and actively avoid re-traumatization. Um, so trauma-informed care really focuses on, on everyone, patients, families, and healthcare staff. So now let's think about this case example for a minute. Uh, so meet Sarah. Sarah is a 12 year old with Down syndrome, um, followed by a specialty Down syndrome clinic at a major children's hospital, two hours from the family's home. Um, annual blood work is required as part of her annual clinic visit. Um, the Down syndrome clinic provides uh, providers are experienced, but care is not always provided in uh, DC, DS clinic. Um, so sometimes she'll have to receive care uh, closer to home at her local hospital. So Sarah and her dad arrive at the lab. They have a rough time getting out of the house in the morning and need to wait 30 minutes to be called back. The lab tech is clearly overwhelmed and tells Sarah's dad that he needs to, get calm, needs to get her calm so that she can do this quickly. After three attempted sticks, the lab tech gives up and tells Sarah and her dad that she can't help them anymore. So as we move forward, let's keep Sarah in mind. Um, so what issues may Sarah and her family run into during this visit um, to the lab for annual blood work? What could the provider and healthcare staff do to prepare for Sarah's visit? Um, how can the staff be more trauma informed? Um, what do you or what could, you know, what could her caregivers do to prepare for the possible stressful medical event? Um, so as we continue and begin discussing how to prepare and navigate stressful medical events, um, please feel free to use the chat and share any ideas or thoughts uh, you may have. I'll hand it over to Kim. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Kim Cantor. I am a uh, pediatric psychologist and a research scientist. Um, 
at New Moore's in the Center for Healthcare Delivery Science. And I'm, I'm also a member of the Center for Pediatric Traumatic Stress with, with Gabby. Um, so what I'm going to transition to talking about is um, ways to prepare and manage stressful medical events, um, recognizing that for children with Down syndrome or um, other intellectual or developmental disabilities, there are many instances where you will need to have encounters with the healthcare system. So, so many opportunities for stress to present itself in the medical environment. So I'm gonna start talking about um, preparing for the medical events in advance, and then we will um, provide some information about coping in the moment. Uh, next slide, please, Gabby. So the first, the first place we wanted to start was thinking about um, thinking about using um, a visual schedule or other preparatory strategies to get ready for the visit. So what this could look like at home is using um, dolls or other toys to act out the visit. Um, one thing that, that will help with this and with preparation in general is um, whenever possible, get information from the care team in advance about what to expect. So what will this visit involve? What will this procedure look like? Um, how long should we expect the visit to take? Any information that you can then use to provide to your child um, in the best way possible, thinking about their developmental level, their communication style, this will, will help you be, be prepared. Um, on the right of this slide is, is a really nice example of a visual schedule, which is um, a way to use pictures to share the steps of the appointment. So you can see, I know that the text is small, but um, there's a picture of the doctor, the doctor interacting with the child, the visit ending. So a visual schedule, um, especially for an individual with limited verbal skills or who prefers a visual communication style, um, this can be a really nice way to prep. Now this, this next one here, um, we recognize that there are a lot of times where you might not be able to coordinate um, a pre-visit. So I, I know this is not the, the easiest recommendation necessarily, but if possible, um, a pre-visit where you can show your, your child um, what the space looks like, get them comfortable with being in the hospital setting or being in the lab and having this be a, a positive experience. So going, seeing what you can, um, possibly interacting with a staff member and then um, going home and being able to use that experience to talk about what will happen next time. Um, and you know, giving, giving advance notice is important too. And you, you know, you are the experts in your, your child. So you will know better than us if, if the, if, and how these strategies might help you. Um, but, but for a lot of, a lot of kids, teens and, and young adults, um, it's good to know. So we don't want to surprise anyone. Like we get in the car, we don't know where we're going and surprise, we're at the hospital and we need to get, get some blood work done. Um, so it's, it's good to you know, be, be honest and give advance notice, but more often than not, you don't wanna give too much notice. So we wouldn't necessarily want to be talking about going to get a shot two weeks in advance um, because then there's a lot of time for 
worrying about it and and talking about it and and thinking about it. Um, but some advance notice tends to be helpful for many um, many individuals with with medical encounters. Next slide. Oh, thanks, Gabby. Um, this this slide here is showing some um, direct activities for individuals um, that can help them explore and understand the different emotions they might be experiencing um, in lots of different settings, and then give some shared language for um, preparing for and talking about a potentially stressful medical event. So for, for um, younger children um, or, or for some teens and adults, this might be um, helping them name their feelings, um, helping children to understand what feelings they're having and that these feelings are um, normal and that we have some ways to work through those feelings can be a really nice uh, way to prepare for a medical encounter either. Because if we have um, comfort and, and awareness of what it means to feel worried or to feel um, angry, to feel calm, that can help uh, communicate more effectively in the moment. Um, next slide, please. So this um, this next slide here, this is actually an example of um, uh, what what we called a, a brave chart. Um, a, a few years ago, I I was lucky to work with um, a, a ten year old with Down syndrome who um, needed to have some blood work done and had um, extreme anxiety about the procedure to, to the point where um, the family and the medical team felt that working with a psychologist would really be beneficial for this child. So not, not every person will, um, will need to work with a psychologist, but, but some will. And this, this tool in general, um, I think there are some ways to adapt something like this for um, for the home home setting or not necessarily working with a psychologist. So what what we were um, fortunate to be able to do because of my location in the, the same hospital where the family received their um, Down syndrome care was um, I was able, we were able to take some pictures of what the space looked like. And then we, um, we arranged a, a series of appointments where we, um, we engaged in a, a treatment approach called exposure um, for medical anxiety. So we started out doing things like sitting by the lab, um, we rated how I feel before, we, we, act, we used um, visual images. So from a smiley face to a frowny face, we practiced using this rating scale and we rated how I felt before, how I felt after. And then we, we were able to put a, a big sticker in the I did it box each time we, we were successful. Um, and we were able to, um, to work with the lab in this case, to even build up to doing things like practicing having her name called, walking around the lab, um, sitting in the chair. We got some, um, <clears throat> some, some of the materials, so not, um, not like a, a needle or anything potentially dangerous, but we were able to get um, some of the tape that goes around your arm and some other things that the family could bring home and play with to get comfortable with the materials. Um, and this, this was very helpful when the time actually came to, to get the blood work done. So any, um, any direct experience with the, the setting is um, very, very helpful. 
Next slide, please. Um, this this next slide here is um, an example of a care plan, and this is um, this is similar to some of the things we've shown before, but a, a really nice um, a really nice example of what this could look like. So we we fill out some information about the child. Um, things I like, things I, I like to do, things I'm excited about, um, what I'm good at, what skills I have, and then the relevant medical information. Um, and this, you know, this really gets to Gabby's point about trauma-informed care, considering the whole individual. So not just thinking about this snapshot in time where I'm interacting with a family, there's a lot of stress. Um, we want to understand what this looks like, what the, the family, what the child's life looks like outside of the hospital to really understand how to provide the best supports. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is Another slide just focusing on the importance of uh, a coping plan. Um, I think you, you can probably tell how important and, and helpful we think this, this approach can be. Um, but, but starting with some, some prompts, like things I can do, things that bother me, um, things others can do to help, can all set, set you up for more, more success in the visit. If your child or um, adolescent or young adult is, is nonverbal or communicates differently, um, you can use play or drawings to help develop this too. So let's draw a picture of things that we like. Let's draw a picture of things that help us feel good. So there, there are ways to modify all of this. Um, you know, we have we have another presentation in about a month focused more on parents and caregivers, but as the caregiver, you are ex extremely, extremely important um, to to how how your child handles um, a, a medical experience. So things that can help um, you prepare and support them are thinking about what resources and supports do you need? What information and resources does your child need? Um, what resources are available along the way to, to help you, to help the caregiver? And we, we have some resources to share towards the end of this presentation. So before before we transition to the the next session the section the the in the moment part I want to go back to our our case example and think about um, things that might help Sarah prep for this this visit so in this case um, Sarah loves Mickey Mickey Mouse. Um, so her parents work with her at home to play. Mickey goes to the doctor. So they start playing with Mickey in medical so with a, a stethoscope and using some um, some medical play to help get comfortable with the um, with the the concept of visiting a doctor, going to have a, something done. Um, Sarah's parents. Are, are able to bring Sarah to the lab a few days before her blood draw to see the facility and to have that positive experience to earn a prize for being brave. So again, recognizing that not everyone can do this, but that that preparatory visit to, to help get her ready. Um, and Sarah's parents write down a few notes for the lab tech to help set the visit up to be successful. So they use um, a template like the ones we showed to just communicate some strategies to help the visit go more smoothly.
So what we'll talk about now is handling stressful medical events in the moment. So you've done all of your preparation, the day is here, you arrive, how do we um, handle this in, in the moment? Um, now, I, I, I know I just mentioned this again, and we, we will focus more on taking care of, of you in our, our second uh, seminar in this series. But we, we did, Gabby and I felt like it was really important to just communicate um, that it can feel hard to impossible to make time to, to think about yourself when there are pressing needs for your child. Um, but making sure to take care of yourself helps you take care of, of others. So making sure that you're meeting your, your basic needs. So are, you know, if you're not sleeping or you're not eating, it, it will be really hard to, to, to function, um, let alone to help your child. Similarly, um, paying attention to your own stress and your own emotions, um, trying to find time to do an activity that helps you mentally and emotionally um, and, and not being afraid to ask for help. So if there's a family member who can help you or you know you need something from someone else, not being afraid to, to ask for that. Um, in the moment, these are, these are some tips that, that we have found to be, um, very useful. So something that, um, can be very helpful is, is this idea of getting time on your side. So if you are having a, a multidisciplinary visit, you're seeing a few different providers, is the really stressful part better at the beginning? Is it better at the end? See if there are ways that the team can help you plan the visit flow to be most helpful. Um, advocating and, and asking for the care that you've agreed on. And um, I, I guess I'm speaking for myself here, I know that can be a challenging thing to do to, um, to speak up in the medical setting, but remembering that um, everyone wants to help your child get the care that they need. So if there are things that um, you had discussed or that were supposed to be provided and they're not happening, um, feeling empowered to ask and advocate for that care. Um, offer choices when appropriate. So there are likely some things that are, are not negotiable. So certain parts of the medical visit, things that have to happen, but there are also times where there really can be a choice. And this could look like, do you wanna sit on the exam table or do you wanna sit in the chair? Do you want dad to hold your hands or do you want dad to sit next to you quietly? Any opportunity to involve and empower your child is, is really powerful. Um, be honest and use language that is appropriate for your child. So tell them what's, what's happening. If they're going to get a shot, don't tell them there won't be a shot. If, um, but keep it at a level that they will understand um, and that will make sense to them. So be truthful, but be developmentally appropriate. Um, be clear about what the expectations are. So what you need from your child, but also be kind with yourself and with your child. So a successful visit does not mean no crying. A successful visit doesn't mean no arguing. Um, know that in times of stress, we are often not at our best. So, you know, communicate what, what you expect, use these strategies to help the visit go smoothly, but also know that there, there may be challenges that still present themselves. 
Um, and as a parent, you know, as, as much as you're able, stay calm and avoid outsized responses to behaviors that may be frustrating. So if your child, you know, bats away the hand of the provider, is that frustrating? Is that maybe embarrassing as a parent? Sure. But again, this is your child in a setting that is, is very stressful for them. So do your best to, to take a deep breath, to stay calm, to praise your child for the things that you're noticing that are going well or even going okay. Wow, you're sitting on the table. I can, I can see how, how you're trying to use your deep breathing. Just modeling for them by being calm, what, um, what will be, be helpful. Um, distraction is, is something we wanted to call special attention to. Um, so distraction is, is an evidence-based strategy for minimizing pain and providing support to children during medical events. And distraction um, can be lots of different things. This is another example of you as the expert for, for your child. Um, but we have some examples here of things that for different ages from infancy up through adulthood can be helpful. So for, for infants or babies, um, singing a preferred object, uh, a pacifier. Um, if, you know, if, if you have an infant or a young child and you're breastfeeding, um, breastfeeding can be another way to, uh, not, not really distraction, but to, to stay calm and, and provide support. Um, here are some suggestions for toddlers, um, blowing bubbles, watching a video, listening to music. Um, and then for school-age kids and adults, many of the same strategies will be useful. Something like a favorite video, a favorite electronic device can be extremely useful for older individuals. Um, and this, this last note here for teenagers and adults is, is not actually distraction, but is very important and a great example of where choice comes into play, um, providing the option to, to watch the procedure. So um, again, you know, for, for me personally, I, I do not want to watch an IV go in. I do not want to watch a blood draw, but some people actually do want to watch and feel more in control. So avoiding assumptions and offering the option is great here. Um, I think this is on our resource page at the end, but there's a free tool called Distraction in Action. Um, it's a website. You can sign up for a free account, um, provide some information about your child and get additional customized um, suggestions and tools, which are very helpful. This is a very nice visual um, that we like as a uh, simple, effective strategy for managing stress or anxiety and promoting deep breathing. So in this tool, um, what you do or what you encourage your child to do is hold up your hands or I'm gonna hold my hand up so you can see what I'm doing. And as you trace around your fingers, you focus on taking a deep breath in as you get to the top of the finger and a deep breath out as you get to the bottom. So, and you go around the whole hand. Um, and this can be a really nice, very concrete way to encourage deep breathing. We wanna talk about um, comfort holds also. So I think in, you know, in, in the pediatric setting, which is where I'm most familiar, um, there's 
there's been, I think, some really good progress in this area, but um, you know, there's there's so much variability here. But what what I mean by comfort hold is we know that using age and developmentally appropriate comfort positions can help your child relax and stay still during a, a painful procedure. So this, um, you know, for many of us, this is again, a time when choice can be so important. How do you wanna sit? Where do you wanna sit? Um, but to, to minimize your child's anxiety more often than not, um, we want to try avoiding laying them flat. Some, some people will prefer to lay down, but, oh, right but a, here, lot of, right. a lot of people um, do better not laying flat. Um, for infants and young children, they can be held chest to chest or back to chest. Um, older children and teens should ideally sit upright. Um, this is actually what I should have mentioned for um, anyone who's breastfeeding. Breastfeeding during a needle poke is often feasible. Um, you know, I, I want to note here that I am not, I'm not a, I'm not a medical provider. I'm not a physician. So I, I can't say with any kind of authority whether or not a parent can be holding a child for a, a certain procedure. But um, in my, my clinical experience, there, there are many times where a parent can be holding a child or helping to position them comfortably and a, a provider should be able to, to work with you there. Um, offering that choice to school-aged children and older is, is a great way to, to give empowerment. Um, another, another point, related to this is, um, you know, if your child, if you think this would work well for your child asking, do you want a count? Do you want to count one, two, three before the, the shot working to find ways to prep them and keep them comfortable? Um, some children and teens may benefit from holding a comfort object like a, a special blanket or a stuffed animal. Um, and recognizing that this is not always possible uh, to the extent that restraints can be avoided, we, we do um, encourage that avoiding restraints when possible. We, we want to really um, help the child stay still and safe and, and try and avoid having them feel like they're they're trapped or being punished or being hurt. So avoiding restraints when possible. Um, next slide, please. So I, I wanna go back to this, this case example and think about how um, the situation could, could go for Sarah using some of the skills that we talked about. So, we have here um, that Sarah and her dad arrive to the lab. Mickey, the special comfort object is, is there to provide support. Um, Sarah's dad reminds the, the staff at the front desk that um, as they've discussed when they scheduled and picked the appointment time, Sarah needs to be seen quickly and that the blood draw should occur in the quiet private room. So. Many labs have, a, not all again, but many labs have a private space or a quiet space. And for a child who um, is sensitive to a lot of noise or commotion, um, it can be very helpful to, to go in that quiet space. So this is done in Sarah's case. Um, the lab tech asked Sarah how she would like to sit in a chair like this or like this, which arm to use for the blood draw. And then um, Sarah watches the show on her iPad and that until the blood draw is done. So able to integrate some of these skills to have a successful outcome. Um, and now I'm, I'm gonna um, pass back to Gabby just to share some additional tips and resources before we move to the, um, the 
questions in the chat and any other questions. Okay. Let me go through um, these tips and resources that we wanted to share with you all. Um, so it's common to have some acute traumatic stress reactions, as we've been saying, um, and these usually diminish with time and support. Um, it's time to get concerned when these reactions last uh, more than a month or cause severe distress or get in the way of the child getting back to normal activities. Um, you know your child and family the best, as Kim was saying, so we want to empower you to seek help when something seems different or distress seems too high. Um, and we also have um, a blog post by one, uh, one of our CPTS team members um, called Therapy for Your Child and You. Um, and this little QR code there uh, will take you to that post so you can read more and this link here as well. And evidence-based treatments such as exposure therapy can be very helpful with medical fears. Um, this therapy involves very gradually exposing a person to the fearful object or situation. Um, so for example, you know, going back to that case uh, example, let's say Sarah has a fear of needles. Um, exposure therapy could be used to help her overcome a fear of needles. Um, a therapist or a provider might begin by building a fear ladder. Um, with less scary needle experiences on the bottom um, and the most scary ones on the top. Um, so they might start by looking at photos of needles, um, then watching videos of someone having a blood test, um, then you know, looking at and maybe touching a real needle, um, then visiting, if it's possible, visiting the lab where the patient will get the needle done, working up to the final experience on that ladder. Um, actually getting the blood test or shot. So just an example of what, what that exposure therapy might look like. Um, and a good first step is to ask your, your healthcare team uh, for referrals and re resources. So again, evidence-based care is important. Um, and you can ask about these, these tools that they're using. Um, there's also screening and assessment tools that, that providers are, are using um, to survey, to screen um, for, for PTSD and, you know, anxiety and other uh, symptoms of, of traumatic stress. So here we're sharing our healthcaretoolbox.org website. And again, a QR code that'll take you um, straight to the site. Um, so we increase awareness and recognition of medical traumatic stress through our online resources. And this is our primary site. Um, and we have had over 200,000 uh, visitors to our site in the last three years. Um, and we did just update it. We went through a, a big relaunch in 2020. Um, so we have a lot of, of new updated resources on there. And this is just a screenshot of the healthcare toolbox. Um, it is a lot of uh, information on here is for healthcare providers, but we do have a specific section for patients and families as well, as you can see in this drop down list. And on there, you'll find different evidence-based tip sheets, workbooks, um, guides for kids and parents. Um, all of our resources are available in English and Spanish, and some of our resources are available in additional languages. Um, we have screeners that are available up to like 25 languages. Um, so they are free downloads um, PDF, and if anyone is ever interested in hard copies, they are available for purchase as well. And the cool thing about Healthcare Toolbox is we also link to a lot of um, the family-led and national organizations that we partner with um, to provide coping uh, resources for coping with stress reactions for both children and parents. And again, um, they are in English and Spanish. Um, and all of this you can find on healthcaretoolbox.org. And we also have um, a book that was written by actually our, or co-written by our co-director of CPTS, um, Megan Marzak, um, Afraid of the Doctor. Um, so a guide to preventing and managing medical trauma that's also available for purchase. And then we have some additional um, online resources. Um, and all of these uh, resources we will share with you um, after, after this, this webinar. 
and more resources. Um, so we have a bunch of resources. Um, After the Injury is also a CPTS uh, website that is available in English and Spanish um, for parents of injured children. Um, copingspace.org, which I think we also mentioned, um, is a website for parents of children with serious illness. They just launched a brand new site called justsibs.org, which is specific for teens uh, who have siblings uh, with an in illness or injury. There's a few uh, videos on here as well. Uh, managing anxiety in children, um, some distraction, uh, parent as distraction coaches videos. Um, Invisa Youth is also a charity um, that, that we work with um, and the founder is on our family advisory uh, committee. Uh, and Kim and I were actually recently guests on the Invisa Youth podcast series. So there is another uh, QR code and that final link at the bottom um, takes you to the podcast. So that is our um, podcast debut. So uh, you can check that out. Also wanted to mention, um, as we mentioned, we're celebrating, uh, CPTS is celebrating their 20th anniversary. And as a part of that, we are hosting a series of webinars this month. So next Wednesday, um, 2 p.m. Eastern time um, or 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, Kim will be leading our third webinar. So this presentation um, will speak directly to the experiences and needs of patients and families affected by injury and illness. Um, attendees will learn about pediatric medical traumatic stress, signs and symptoms, um, and coping and advocacy skills, as well as caregiver resources will, will be shared there as well. And this last slide, um, we just wanted to thank you for your time and attention today. You can also follow us on um, CPTS's account. Um, we are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook um, under P at P trauma stress. Um, here's the healthcaretoolbox.org um, QR code again. And if there's any questions um, or follow up, feel free to email Kim, myself, or our CPTS um, uh, email at nemours.org. And that is all that we can look at the questions. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. So I want everybody to feel free to ask questions. Um, there are some in the chat. And then if you'd also like to raise your hand and ask live, um, we'll call you on that. If you don't know how to raise your hand, just hit your reaction button at the bottom and look for the little raise hand.